Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Monday. What's today? The 27th, April 27th, the last week of classes. Woohoo! You excited? Can you see me? Am I too close? Hey, before I record my video, I want to show you our wonderful band room. That's where I am now. So, this is, of course, the normal corner here. But as I rotate the camera around, look at all of this stuff. Look at all of this stuff. So we've been kicked out of Knutson while they're working, and uh, the, I guess the marching band storage rooms, they're working on those. So uh, we have quite a, quite a uh, collection of things here uh, in the band room. So, uh, so I, um, I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, you know, I've had a chance to chat with a few of you. I ran into Sean in the, at Walmart the other day. We were talking about the class and the whole thought. And, and I do agree that having non-regular meeting times is easy to kind of forget about the class. Um, and that's something going forward that, you know, if we have to do this again in the future, that's something that I'll obviously realize. Now, the last thing I want to do is just give you a bunch of busy work and make you do all kinds of stuff when, again, it's only a one credit class. So I was trying to kind of replicate what you'd be experiencing in the class, which is me speaking, you reading, doing taking notes, and, and then we take tests. So it's kind of similar, it's just that you're doing it once a week or maybe every other week, kind of, uh, binging on my wonderful videos. Um, so I hope it's all working out for you. If there's any questions, um, I also got a, a, an email from Casey wanting uh, printouts of the old uh, tests. I'm pretty sure I can do that. I, I, if I can't screenshot the actual tests that we made online, I have old printed versions of these tests that I tweaked and made into our new tests. I can always send you PDFs or Word documents of those, but I'll be able to send one of the two, and I'll do that this week, early this week. Um, so you have that to study for the final exam. Um, that leads me to, why don't I, while I have you on, while you have me on camera, um, let's see if I can dial up our final exam schedule to give you the exact date of our final exam. And obviously I'll be putting this on email. Um, all right. So our final exam is going to be next week. And our exam time um, Oh, golly gee willikers. make you download it. Okay, here we go. Uh, so our class is at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, Thursday. So that puts it between the 9.30 and 11 o'clock time slot Tuesday, Thursday. It shows our final exam being on Tuesday, May 5th from 3 to 5 p.m. So what I'm going to do is our exam is going to be on Tuesday, May 5th, and again, I'll be emailing this out. Tuesday, May 5th will be our exam day. That's a week and one day from right now. Um, you'll have 24 hours. Again, I'll have it up there, same idea, but I'm gonna limit it to two hours. You get two hours for the final exam. Um, it's a big exam, it's huge. Cumulative, open book, open note, open old tests, all of that stuff. So, but make sure you're, you're, you're prepared because you're going to have to go quickly through it. There's about 100 questions on this final exam. So it's a big, big, big test. Um, so next Tuesday, May 5th, and again, I'll be emailing this out and putting it on our thing. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what we're going to do. It'll be sometime during that day. Again, you'll have 24 hours to take it. Um, and... Um, and then we'll just be we'll be good to go for that. All right, this is going to be the first video of two for marching percussion. Today we're going to talk about general marching percussion ideas, and then dive into snare drum. And then I'll be recording uh, another video with bass drum, tenors, and uh, crash cymbals. Um, so we'll kind of uh, divide it up that way. So first of all, uh, marching band. Uh, I mean, obviously you all know what marching band is, and you know, marching bands are unique 
uh, vehicle for drummers. Um, it's early on in our career um, as drummers, that's where we get kind of our juice. That's where our, all of our excitement lies. When I was in middle school and high school, all I thought about was marching band. It was the end all and be all of my existence, you know. Um, because we have so many great notes that are challenging. We're with all these other people playing these great notes, running around the field, wearing costumes. I mean, there's just an amazing uh, kind of concoction of senses and things to make it really be awesome for drummers. Uh, now you compare that to playing the triangle in Brahms Symphony Number no. 4, and as a child, uh, there, that's, that's boring. There's nothing to this. This doesn't seem like a whole lot of fun versus strapping on one of these things, running around the field with my friends outside and having a lot of fun that way. So we, we love this, right? And that's good. There's nothing wrong with loving marching band. It's a great, great, great thing. The problem comes in where we can turn it, kind of the, dog, the tail wagging the dog, all right? We can allow marching band, particularly when it comes to drummers, to take up all of their time in high school, all right? It's very easy, and a lot of schools in our area do that, okay? Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with loving this stuff. This is great. I love drumline. I still love drumline. I love playing this stuff. I love getting together, lining things up, listening to each other, working on my chops. It's a great challenge, and I love it. But I also love now playing Triangle Brahms Fourth Symphony. Okay? So the examples, the extreme examples are, and this is a very common example, right? This is something that we see all over the place in South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, and Minnesota. So, um, Marching season, of course, is in the fall, right? So, but starting in, say, March of the previous year, we oftentimes have auditions for the drum line for the coming year, because they want to get it in before the end of the school year. And we start having rehearsals to get chops up, to get things rolling. Oftentimes, band directors have the music purchased at that time, and so they're able to start working on the notes. If not, they're just working on exercises and, again, working on getting stronger. And they would have these meetings, you know, sometimes they have it once a week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes even more. But, you know, they have, they have uh, it, it's a part of their, 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 their deal. And they're really uh, committed to starting these rehearsals, usually late spring, right, March, April. Summer comes around. Most schools do a summer camp regularly for the drill line. You know, oftentimes once a week for many, many parts of the summer, maybe even more than that, okay? And of course the fall, we all know 24 seven, right? So you wake up in the morning, you start rehearsal at seven in the morning, and then you go through the day, oftentimes the drumline sectional in addition to that, all right? Um, so you go all the way through, we get to November, season's over, and all of a sudden right in November, we start gearing up for winter drumline. What is winter drumline? It's basically just drumline with usually a front ensemble playing without a band. Usually they play in basketball courts, okay? And again, that's great, right? Indoor, indoor drumline, there's some really cool, exciting stuff happening with that. But then of course that goes up and through February, right? Because you're playing for basketball games. So you go up through February and then now we're back to March again. So basically these kids, they're spending all year doing marching band and then everything else gets pushed to the side. All the concert playing, all the subtle playing, all the uh, other opportunities to play uh, gets really pushed aside. And, and all we do is, is just infatuate ourselves with, with, with drumline and marching percussion. All right? um, and as a director, you can kind of see it as, why is that a bad thing? All right? You have these kids who are working their butts off so that your ensemble sounds better. That's a good thing, right? You're not going to say, stop practicing, go do something else, right? You're going to, yeah, great, you sound great, I wonder, love that. Um, but it creates this, this, this kind of um, atmosphere of only marching band being important, all right? And it really creates a kind of a, if you play anything else, if you play the oboe, or you play a string instrument, or anything that doesn't have to do with marching band, you're kind of ostracized. I remember being, when I myself, I was in high school, and there were some people who weren't in marching band. They played an instrument, they were in the concert band, 
Um, but they weren't in marching band. And we all kind of raised our eyebrows at them because why would they not be in marching band? What, what else is there in life other than marching band? Um, and so it causes a bit of discord there, and it might stunt their uh, educational growth as musicians, right? There's a lot more music out there beyond marching band, beyond DCI, all right? And so if you can expose them and have them play in these other forms, it's they're going to grow as players, okay? Um, and I was, I was the same thing. And when I was, I grew up in Indiana, my teacher was uh, Richard Saucedo, if you know that name, he's written a lot of pieces. Super hardcore marching, right? That was that's all we did. Um, I had to transfer schools. I moved to Wisconsin in the middle of my junior year. The school that I moved to in Wisconsin wasn't nearly as diehard about marching band. They were a little bit more towards jazz band, a little more balanced of a, of a, of a group. And all of a sudden, I saw all these things I'd never seen before. I thought about things I'd never seen before. It blew my mind, all the different music that could be out there, all the different ideas um, that I didn't think existed, right? All-state band. You know, why would you do all-state band as a, as a drummer? You know, if we're just drumming, all-state band, you don't play drumline music in all-state band. Why would I want to do that? And so, all of a sudden, I started to participate in those things. I learned mallets much better. I learned all these different things that didn't have to do with marching band. And so, um, and that's really what's propelled me. If you think about how many professional orchestras are there, of course, now there are none, but two months ago, how many professional orchestras were there? And then how many professional marching bands are there, right? And so you can think about jobs. Now, obviously, playing in an orchestra is really hard to get, but as far as jobs, you know, as far as an aspiration, where are you going? Being a marching drummer is not necessarily going to get you hired beyond being a, a well-rounded orchestral drum set player, world music, all of the things that we've covered all year round, okay? So to me, I would suggest balancing what you do in your band. And the kids are not gonna wanna balance, right? They're too young, A, and B, they love this. This gives them so much juice. This is all they're gonna wanna do, all right? I brought a snare drum home with me and I would march around my city block. I loved it so much. Okay? And so you've got to make sure that you're opening their eyes and ears to other types of music, um, to specifically drummers. Now your other players, if you play trumpet, trumpet and marching band isn't all that different than trumpet and concert band, trumpet and jazz band. In fact, you're just running around a field, right? It's the same kind of notes. If you play first trumpet, you're going to get juice in all those ensembles, and they're going to be exciting. As a drummer, you know, orchestra, band, we don't need nearly the cool notes that we would get in marching band. Especially as a young kid, the more the merrier, right? The higher, faster, louder, that's all we want to do. So I would recommend balancing in your uh, department. How you do that, that depends on, on your strengths, depends on your band, it depends on your drummers, it depends on all that stuff. So there's a lot of different ways you can do that. I'm not going to tell you how to do that because I won't know until you get a job. Uh, but I would find a way to balance that. That would be a good, good thing. So, okay. Uh, so historically, obviously the marching band comes out of the, the, tradition, the, um, the um, military world, right? So we had marching bands, and the marching drums uh, and marching bands really go back to the 1600s. Um, and they, a lot of the stuff that we do comes from that style of playing. It's a very old style of playing that's evolved over many hundreds of years. Um, the instruments, you know, we've taken from other cultures, right? The snare drum kind of comes from Europe and then somewhat um, a little bit of, of Middle East, but the bass drum and the uh, tenor drum and the cymbals, those all come from Turkey. If you've seen the Shriners Band, in the um, <clears throat> D-Day's parade, all right? So the Shriners band, historically, they would play a bass drum, they'd play a long kind of tenor drum, and they'd play cymbals along with their shams, and they're replicating um, this Janissary band, this band from Turkey, okay? And so a lot of the things we do come from that. So it's a very, 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 very old tradition. And so there's a lot of things that we do that come from that old tradition at the same time, we're constantly developing, refining, and adding things to it, okay? Um, so uh, one of the terms that I've used before, and it's really important when it comes to marching percussion, is uh, Drum Corps International, DCI, as it's called. I'm sure most of you know what this is, but it's basically semi-professional marching bands in the summertime. 
you don't get paid to play in it. In fact, you have to pay money to play in it. Um, but it's as close as you can get to a professional group, right? And you pay 3000 5000 I don't know what it costs now. And you get in a bus and you travel around the, the, the country playing with, um, playing with kids in a marching band. Um, and it's a great, 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 great opportunity. And it's really kind of the engine behind a lot of what we do, um, the technology of drums, uh, and, and, and actually what we're playing today. A lot of what we play, we've kind of gleaned from that style of playing. It's kind of like um, Formula One and NASCAR, right? Those tech, new technologies show up in, in auto racing, and then about 10 years later, they filter down to the cars that we drive every day. Okay, so it's the same kind of idea. DCI is what's driving our technology and our playing as we go forward. So a lot of the things that we do is are inspired by or modeled after what happens in uh, in DCI. Um, all right. Um, so let's talk about instrument. Oh, first of all, let's talk about the number of players in your drum line. Um, if you can. And most of you will not be able to because you'll be, you'll, you have the kids that you have. But if you can, it's really good to balance the drum line with the ensemble. All right? It's a really good idea to make sure you've got the right number of players to go with your band. You don't want the drum line too loud. You don't want the drum line too soft. In your book, on page... Do, 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 do. Uh, maybe he took it out in this edition. Maybe he took it out. It was in the old one. Um, goodness gracious. Yeah, he took it out. Um, so, ideally, if you have, let's say you have... 60 wind players in your band. Um, you want probably anywhere from two to four snare drummers, um, anywhere between three to five bass drummers. Um, we'll talk about those um, when we get to the bass drum thing. Um, two, maybe tenor players, um, and then as many cymbal players as you can get. To me, cymbal players are great. There's nothing wrong with having too many cymbal players. Typically, I like to have at least as many cymbal players as I have snare players. I mean, obviously, in the last few years at USD, we haven't been able to do that. But I'd love to have those be the same number because oftentimes snare drummers have to hit the cymbal players. And if you have one cymbal player per snare drum, then you can have a dedicated cymbal player to be hit on. Um, so that's in a perfect world, right? If you have a band that's larger than that, you can have more drummers. If you have smaller than that, you can have smaller numbers, okay? Um, if you can't make that distinction, in other words, you have the drummers that you have, you don't have enough or you have too many, then you need to make some choices about what they play and how you tune the drums. So a very common thing is to have too few drummers in your band. All right? So too few drummers in the band, the problem with our tuning today, and we'll go through each instrument as we go, the tuning today is very high, very high pitched, very short sounding uh, drums. Your snare drum, very typical sound for your snare drum, okay? Um, if you have only one snare drummer, or one bass drummer, or one tenor player, that sound can be really thin, all right? It's very, very oftentimes, especially if you have a single snare drummer marching in a parade with, with a, a no, normal sized band, one drummer with this kind of head on this kind of drum is gonna sound very thin, and it's not going to project. It's not going to fill out the sound. So if you have one snare drummer, we'll talk about that, um, you want to change the head that you use and you want to change the tuning. Okay? If you have one bass drummer, same thing. You want to maybe change the head, but you definitely want to change the tuning. Tenor player, again, same thing. You don't want a really high-pitched tenor. If you have one player, you want it a little bit lower. Lower sounds are going to be a little bit more loud. The resonance of the head is going to help it. Cymbal players, you can kind of get away with one, um, but if you only have one, then you actually have to make them play correctly. Right? If you have more than one, they can slam them together any way they want. Um, but more than, only one, they need to play correctly. Okay. Uh, 
um, if you have the instruments, fill them up, all right? Except maybe it's gonna say you have only a band of 30 and you have eight snare drummers, right? I've never seen that, but you, that may be a possibility. You don't want that, obviously. It's too many snare drummers for your band. It's gonna be way too loud, all right? Move them over the bass drum, maybe cymbals. Um, you know, if you're only doing parades, uh, a front line, which we'll talk about later. Actually, we get to talk a lot about front line because we have all kinds of time. It's another thing we're going to dive into that I haven't really do too much with. That's cool. Good. Um, so um, you can move them. I know, like at state, when they do parades, they have their front line playing cymbals, and so they'll have 10 to 15 cymbal players on their parades. Right? Usually, they're just keeping time, but they're there marching in the parade. All right. Most of us don't have marching xylophones and marimbas and bells anymore. Uh, they kind of went away. Um, but you'll want to kind of figure out ways to make it work. I know this next year, if there's school, um, Vermilion High, he has a ton of drummers, too many drummers. He has more drummers than he has instruments. Way more drummers than he has instruments. So he is going to, he's working on a piece, writing a piece, uh, where they're playing junk, and he's going to come up with all these different sound sources for them to play on the field to keep them all busy and doing something, okay? All right. Um, talk about that later. Let's just dive right into snare drum, and then we'll kind of get into all the other stuff as we go, and then we'll follow up. Well, we'll see where this all leads here. A um, little bit different thing than having a class period. And actually, and having unlimited time is all of a sudden throwing me for a loop because I want to add so much more into it. All right, so first of all, snare drum. Marching snare drums are usually going to be very deep like this and 14 inches in diameter. That's important to know because of last, last decade, maybe even before that, we were experimenting with 13 inch snare drums. Snare drums, sorry, 13 inch snare drums. Um, the idea was we were tuning the drums so high what if we went to a smaller drum? Maybe it would make it easier to tune it that high. It didn't work out that well. It's not a great instrument to drive your marching band. It's nice for indoor drum line, but it's not good for outside. And so we went back to 14 inch, but you can still buy 13 inch snare drums, okay? Um, I would recommend not. I would recommend buying 14 inch snare drums. The depth, is you don't really get a choice in the depth. Um, but you have two options as far as the, um, the diameter of the drum. Uh, there are two companies that you really want to look for for marching percussion. Yamaha and Pearl. Yamaha is Japanese. Pearl is, I believe, Taiwanese. I think it's Taiwanese. Um, those are the two companies. Pearl now is in Nashville. Um, but those two companies have the best marching drums. Right? Uh, Ludwig, don't even think about it. All right, they were cool about 30 or 40 years ago, and they stopped, and they haven't been cool since. All right, um, there are some other companies, Dynasty for one, they were really making a big push, um, but I don't recommend Dynasty because I don't know if they're going to be around next week. All right, uh, as of last November, they were they completely dissolved, like overnight, they were done, completely dissolved. And then somebody bought them back out, so now they're back up again. So I don't know what's going on with that. Um, for a while, they were giving their drums away like candy. Um, and so I think they were having some money issues. I don't know how that's working. But Dynasty drums, I wouldn't recommend. And they're not nearly as well built as the Yamaha and the Pearl drums. Yamaha and Pearl. And Yamaha and Pearl drums are very similar in their construction. Um, so we have uh, the marching. This is a Yamaha drum, as you can see it there. This is the Yamaha SFZ. This is their top of the line snare drum. Okay? Um, the way these drums are built, because our tension is so high, we've got a wooden shell. All right, we've got these big long lug casings. And then the top of the drum, the last three inches of the drum, this is actually metal. All right? This is actually, I think it's steel or aluminum, I can't remember, ring at the top of the drum. All right? That's important because if we didn't have that, the head, if I tighten the head up as high as we want it, it would implode the drum. The drum would, would, would break because there's too much tension on the drum. And you'll notice that when I tighten the head, it's only tightening 
into this. All right, so these two pieces of metal are what's tightening together, and then they're attached to the shell, all right? But there's no tension here, and there's none down here as far as the top head, all right? This is very important. If you have older drums, um, let me see if we have one sitting up here. If you have older uh, field drums that are, say, pre-1980s, they're not going to have this technology. And if you try to put the heads that we put on today and tune them the way we tune today, you will destroy the drums. All right? When I was back teaching in college, uh, I was in Vegas, uh, we had old drums, and I was trying to keep the tension low because of the old drums, and we kept getting in trouble by the judges saying our snares were too low. So I said, okay, we raised them up, and every time we raised them, a new lug would pop off and break off the drum, because there's too much tension for those older drums, okay? So if you have an older drum and you have to use them, you have to use what's called a mylar head. Mylar head is the normal snare drum head that we have on everything, all right? Mylar head is just plastic, and they make mylar marching heads, right? And they're specifically for these older drums that can't withstand this kind of um, tweaking of, of, of the top head. If you have one of these drums, the Yamaha or Pearl, newer drums, the head you want to get is the Remo Falam 2. And Falam is spelled F-A-L-A-M. F-A-L-A-M, Falam 2. All right. The head, very much like this. This happens to not be a Flam 2. This is a, a Premier Tendura, which you don't want to get because it'll make you have carpal tunnel. Um, it's made out of um, um, Kevlar. Thank you very much. We had Kevlar. Uh, it's the same thing to make bulletproof vests out of. So it's this weave, right? It's a very, very dense weave, very, sti very stiff, and it's virtually unbreakable, right? You, you will be very hard pressed to break a, ten, uh, a, a Kevlar head. Um, and that's why you need really, really secure drums to hold it in place. Otherwise, it's just not, not gonna work. So that's the top head, your Falam 2 by Remo. Evans also makes heads very similarly, but you want to get, if you can, you want to get that Kevlar head. And these Kevlar heads, you want to put on no other drums other than your marching drums. Do not put them on your snare drum for your jazz band. Do not put them on your concert band drums. You'll destroy the drums, right? You don't want to do that, and it won't sound right. All right? So the, these Kevlar heads really designed to be on, on a marching drum. The bottom head, you have some flexibility. Uh, most people just use some sort of a clear, I like to use clear ambassador. This is the Evans M, is it? MS3, and it has a little bit of a muffling ring on it. Um, doesn't really matter, but usually clear plastic head on the bottom. Okay. Um, we talked about the three thicknesses of snare heads, and you still want to get a snare head, right? So we talked about batter head versus the snare head for snare drum. Um, and how the snare head, hope you remember, a snare head is thinner than the batter head. So when you order a snare head, um, we talked about with concert band, we want to get a diplomat head, but in marching band, we want an ambassador head, okay? Um, you could go with emperor, but usually those are too thick for the bottom head even. So I would usually go with an ambassador batter uh, snare head. And you want it a little thicker, two reasons. One, because we do turn it up a little higher, and two, if they take the drums off their carriers and they put them on the ground, if there's a stick or even sometimes the grass will put holes in that diplomat head. But an ambassador head's gonna be a little bit thicker and it'll last a lot longer, okay? Um, we talked about with your, with your regular drums, ideally in a perfect world you replace every head every year. In marching band, that's vital. It's vital to change every head every year, all right? You've got to do it, all right? You, if you don't, you will sound bad. I don't care if you don't think you sound bad, you do. Right? Every marching band that has a head that's a year older than it should be, their drums cannot be tuned well, 
They lose their carrying power. It's really dull and thuddy. All right, so when you see a marching band going down the street and they've got 10 year old heads on their bass drums, even though there's no holes in it, you can hear it. You can hear how awful they are. Okay, so you've got to change every head every year. If you play DCI, they change every head every week, all right, during, the, during their season. All right, now that's a little ridiculous. You, we don't play that much, we don't play as hard, we don't play as, as often as many notes. So once a week is not necessary. But once a year is really vital. So make sure you allot money in your budget to do that. All right? It costs us about between $1,500 and $2,000 to change the heads out every year. Um, it's really important to do that. Uh, otherwise, the drums will just not sound good. And, and, and then you'll be like, why can't, why aren't the drums carrying? Why aren't they sounding good? And that's the reason. One year, I didn't change the bass drum heads, um, and I regretted it. I regretted it from the first game to the last game because it just it didn't have that sound. I mean, imagine playing a clarinet with the same reed for two years, right? It's the same idea. Just blown out, doesn't have the response, doesn't have that kind of vibrant carrying power that we need. Um, so good. All right. Um, we're talking about stands. I would recommend getting stands for your drum line. They're going to be practicing a lot, hopefully. Um, and if they have to carry the drums every time they practice, it's going to be an obstacle for them rehearsing. Right? They're going to be in pain. And if I want to play, say, for an hour, I want to just play for an hour, that might, that's going to hurt. All right? And so if they're carrying it, they're going to complain a lot sooner than if it's on the stand. All right? The stands are really, really great so you can practice for longer periods of time. And you really want stands that are dedicated for marching percussion. Right. You can make some stands work for this and other things, but they don't work really well. They're really not designed for these type of instruments. These are the best kind of stands. The stands that, um, these are the um, May Stadium stands, and they make them both for Yamaha and Pearl. They're very, very, very similar with a couple different changes to, to fit the drums. Um, the coolest thing about these stands is uh, the legs, I don't think I have to show you, I can just describe it. The legs down here, there's a front leg, there's, it's a tripod. The front leg in the front, you know what, let me grab a stand. Hold on one second. All right, so we have a front leg and a back leg. All right. So the cool thing about these is I can set them up in any configuration I want, and these are designed to be used in stands. Okay. So I have this front leg, and each of the legs slides up and down, which is really cool because if I'm in the stadium, if I'm in the stands, I can have one layer lower, one layer up, and I can really get them in. All right. If you don't have this, you're not going to really be able to stand it up in the stands. And I don't know if you remember this last year with marching men with us being up in the back corner. The bass drums couldn't use these, so they had to lay them down and slam on them on the thing, which is bad for the sound, bad for the instruments, and just looks bad, right? It's just really kind of a bush league thing to have them kind of on the ground. Um, it's much better to have them up. They sound better, they look better, and they're more, to me, respectable by having it up. So these stands allow you to do that. Um, when I got here 16 years ago, we didn't have these, and I said, what do you guys do? Oh, we just carry, we, just, we hold them the entire game. That's a long time to hold them. That's got to hurt so long after that. So I said, no, let's get stands. So we bought stands, and these are great. They're really, really good stands. Um, they work really well. We use them all the time, all right? We use them for rehearsals. We use them in the stands, and you know many of you know that because you're in marching band and you've seen that. But these are great, great stands. So stadium stands, uh, the guy that makes them is Randall May. Uh, he makes all of these stands, one guy. Um, both for both companies, um, and I think there's another set of stands out there, um, but they're newer, and I don't remember what it's called. But I think there's a different stand that exists, same idea, but by a different company, and it's slightly different. Um, but these are great; these are really, really, really groovy. All right. Um, so tuning of your drum. Um, The normal drum key for this drum, which is right here, will not work 
because you have to tune it so high you'll destroy your hands trying to tune it. So you need a high tension key, particularly for this, but even for all the drums, all right? High tension key looks just like this, um, but the has really long T handles. So I can get a lot of torque and I can tune each of these lugs, okay? Uh, depending on the drum that you get and depending on the number of players you have is how you want to tune this, right? You can go to Yamaha's website. I, I go there every year and check it out. Uh, they give you pitch ranges of each head. All right, so you want to tune the head up or down to fit into that pitch range. I usually tune it on the low side of that pitch range because I feel like that's a little bit more kind of DCI oriented, um, which is if you're playing tons of really, really fast notes and you want that kind of really, really crisp sound, which is great, but we need a little bit more volume because we have fewer snare drums. We don't have 10, 12 snare drums. So this right now is a little bit low. All right, that should be up in pitch. This is an old head on an old drum. This is obviously our, our practice drums. Um, uh, and so uh, to tune it up, again, you just want to crank it all the way around nice and high. All right, you want it to be nice and high. There, like I said, there's a pitch range in there, and I don't want to give you that because it's going to depend on, on again, the number of drummers and the, the drums that you have. Uh, but you want it so it sounds like that. Very little resonance, right? There's almost zero resonance that between that and should just be about the same, right? There's almost no resonance of the head. It's just about the same, okay? So we want it as super sh as short as we can get it so that we can hear all the notes that we might play. You hear all those notes really, really, really clearly, okay? Uh, good. All right. Uh, approaching the drum, so matched or traditional are fine. All right, I like traditional, like I talked about, I, you know, I grew up playing traditional, so oftentimes I will play traditional snare drum, but match is perfectly fine also. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, if your drum line doesn't feel comfortable playing traditional, have them play matched. No one is gonna count them off. No one's gonna knock their score because they're not playing traditional. We talked about what the importance of this, and the fact that our drums are straight now, this is not at an angle, there's no reason that we have to play like this. It's cool, and a lot of drummers like it, and if they like it, and it's cool, and they can do it, by all means, go ahead and do it. But if they don't like it, or they don't know how to play it, they're not comfortable with it, have them play matched, right? There's nothing wrong with that, all right? Everybody else in the drum line plays matched. There's nothing wrong with having your snare drummers play matched, okay? Good. Um, uh, talk about the carrier. The height of the snare drum is similar to the height that we had on our concert snare drum. Sometimes this is a little bit higher, particularly if we're playing matched grip or traditional grip. Right? If we're playing traditional grip, I can have the drum up a little higher than if I'm playing matched grip. Right? I can, can this kind of it's easier for my left hand to play if the drum's higher than it is lower. You want to make sure that it's adjusted for each player. Some people like to have the drums look consistent. So they're all the same height, even though the players are different heights. I'm not a fan of that because that means that Mr. Tall Guy is playing a drum that's way down here and Mr. Short Guy is playing a drum that's way up here. All right, so I would recommend that you get the drums adjusted for each person. Each carrier has different bolts and nuts and screws and different things. You have to kind of work it out. You know, the Yamaha is different from the Pearl, is different from everybody else's. So you want to kind of work on that. Um, I, should, I should mention this too. Um, so this is the top line snare drum. So you have that the top line of all the drum line, both Pearl and Yamaha. Both brands have a secondary line that's a little bit lighter, like physically lighter, not quite as uh, beefy. All right, it's a little bit thinner. It's not as not as uh, solid. Um, and sometimes the sizes are a little smaller, and those are designed for middle school bands or uh, groups that are just have small people, okay? So I've known a couple um, high school drum lines who've used these drums, and I can't field, field, I can't remember the name of what they call them. Um, but there's different, they, each of them have their own little thing, but there's a secondary line that you can use. If you're using a marching band in, in middle school, you may want to consider going with those. They're cheaper, they're lighter, your kids are usually smaller, um, 
and, and they're smaller sizes, and so they'll actually go with your band a little bit better um, than, uh, than the top line drums. So, I want to um, Let's talk about some exercises, some concepts that we'll do on snare drum um, that will then transfer to the other instruments. So, um, everything we talked about on snare drum, normal snare drum, applies to this. A couple of exceptions. One, um, we want to be playing open rolls mostly. So we're going to spend a lot of time working on open rolls. Okay, it's a very, very important thing. And two, the visual aspect of what I'm doing is now important. All right? when, I, when I'm inside playing a snare drum and I want to play a big note, there's nothing wrong with being really big coming out of the drum. Now, if I'm on a marching field, there's two problems with that. One, it doesn't look neat, all right? So it's eventually maybe not quite as, as sharp looking. And two, if I have 10 drummers, all of them doing this, we're not going to be playing in time. It's not going to be consistent. So we have to kind of rein things in a little bit. We have to con kind of control our motions, okay? So one of the things that we do um, we talked about this a little bit with our initial uh, snare drum chapter, but I like to talk about the four stroke types. Right? We talked about this before, but I want to talk about it again. Right? So we had the full stroke, which was kind of our full rebound, right? All right? We're going to be using a lot of wrists. We'll just t t do wrists for now. So a full rebound, okay? So that's the full stroke. It's a loud stroke, starts up, and ends up. All right? Then we have our down stroke, which starts up and ends down. It's also a loud stroke, right? So I'm up here, gravity is pulling it down. I have a lot of momentum, hits the head, but I keep it here, all right? The next stroke is the tap, starts down and ends down, all right? Starts down and ends down, nice and soft. Then we have the up stroke, which is starts down and ends up. Starts down, ends up, all right? So those four stroke types, Everything that we do, all the rudiments, everything that we do comes from those four stroke types. So I like to come up with exercises to work on those full four stroke types. So the first thing we want to work on are full stroke, all right? So again, staying relaxed, hitting the drum, and making sure it balances back up where I started. Right? Making sure both hands are doing the same thing. Ideally, marching, bouncing up, the same spot in each hand. Okay? If we do eights, this works on that works on that stroke, right? The idea of just balancing and letting it come up. It's a nice, easy stroke to get kind of our muscles going and get everything happening. Alright? The down stroke. Now the down stroke is not a tension stroke. A lot of kids uh, confuse this with this. All right. So what they, what a lot of kids do is they play with a lot of tension and they hold the stick down so it doesn't bounce out. All right. It's not necessary to do that. You're just going to slow yourself down and hurt yourself. Okay. So what I do, and this is coming from Jeff Queen, snare drum god of the planet. If you've ever heard of Jeff Queen, he's the man. Um, Invented blast, did all kinds of other stuff. But anyway, um, he talks about softening your hand so soft that it becomes like a pillow and it absorbs that rebound and doesn't allow it to rebound. So instead of using tension to hold it into place, I'm going to soften my hand and not, not allow it to come up. All right? It's very similar, if you think about it, to the slap that we did. Um, congas, right? We talk about slap and we relax our fingers and they just stay on the head. Same thing, we're going to relax and it's going to stay here, okay? The important part is we start really big and end really, really low, okay? The next one is the tap. Um, the tap is, um, uh, starts low and ends low. And you have to really make sure that you're able to do that. That's a difficult thing for a lot of drummers to do is play low. Okay, we'll talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about all the stroke types and we'll talk about some more of the exercises that use them. Okay, um, so keeping it nice and low. And then the final one, the hardest stroke to do is the upstroke. 
starting down and ending up, right? By far, the hardest stroke to do, okay? Right? That takes a lot of practice, which is why we do what's called accent tap, or sometimes it's called bucks. And the idea is you have an accent followed by a non-accent. So if we think about it, I was going to slowly play an ax eighth notes, accenting every beat. Okay? Two, ready, and. All right, so there are three strokes used there. We have a down, and then an up, and then a down. And then an up, and then a down, and then an up, and then a down, and then a tap for the and of four. One, and two, and three, and four. So we have four stroke types used there, all right? When we did our eights, almost, almost all, except for the very last note, they're all full strokes. When we do tap accent or accent tap or any sort of accents, non-accents, we have down, up, okay? So, it's very difficult for drummers to keep that in time, okay? What the tendency is, there's two things that happen. One, they don't play the soft notes soft enough and or the loud notes loud enough. So we get, all right, they're too similar, right? You really need to make a huge difference in the, in the volume of the two notes. Right? Huge difference in the sound. Second thing is that second note, the soft note, usually comes too fast after the first note. Oftentimes we get this. It's kind of a bounce, a rebound of the first one. Okay? So we have to really work on this to get any sort of accents in our music. Most of the music we're going to be playing has tons of accent. If you think about Thai, which hopefully we're changing this year, um, Thai is... All right? Ton of accents, ton of notes that aren't accents, right? All right? So, if I don't play those non-accents low enough, if I'm not able to do my down and up strokes, we get... Right? Which is boring, right? Nobody wants to hear that. We want to hear... All right? And again, with the notes... Those notes in there really, really make it so it's clear. And those are really, really, really important to get the accents to come out beyond the non-accents. Okay? It's super, super, super important. Because it's boring. Nobody cares about that. But if I'm playing... Right, it's really, really important. And that all comes down to... So forth, right? So having that that upstroke, working on that, is really, really, really important. Okay. So all the rudiments. Oh, let's talk about rudiments here going going forward. So we talk about rudiments. Rudiments are, and they're in the book. I'm going to reference the page because these are important. Starting on page 378, going through 380, there are 40 rudiments. Okay. Rudiments. Are uh, and we talked about this earlier, but I want to—they're really more important with with marching percussion than they are with concert. Again, rudiments are like scales for snare drum. All right, so there are various patterns that we've played um, over the years that are kind of our bread and butter of things we have to play. Um, these came from historical marching band pieces that we would play, or I should say, military band pieces that we would play certain strokes, okay? So they include, there's 40 of them. There used to be 13, then 26, and now there are 40 of them, okay? They include things with rolls, so five-stroke rolls, seven-stroke roll, long roll, and so forth, flams, paradiddles, so on and so forth, okay? But all of these things have those four stroke types in common. All right, we can take any of these things, any of the 40 rudiments, anything that you play, boil it down, 
to these four stroke types, all right? So it's really, really important to, to acknowledge the, the, the building blocks of everything, which is these four stroke types, understanding how to do the full stroke, down, tap, and the up. Right? They're all very, 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 very important, okay? Um, okay, so we talked about the various single strokes. Now we have to work on double strokes. In marching band, most of the rolls we do are open. Very important to have a good, clean, open roll, and that you, as a group, can play a good, clean, open roll. It's very, very important to be able to line that up, okay? So, open roll versus closed roll. We talked about open roll, double stroke roll, where each hand only makes two sounds. All right, versus a buzz roll, where each hand makes a lot of sounds. Right, it's a difference. Outside in marching band, we play a lot of open stroke rolls, double stroke rolls. Right? Very, very important. So we do a lot of exercises to work on those. There's a lot of different things. I will share my exercises with you. Um, you won't necessarily need them from the test, but I'm, I'm going to throw them up here so that you can have them. Feel free to take them and use them with your band. Okay, when you when you get your gigs, okay, or if you work with a group this coming fall, if you're whatever, but feel free to take them. I'm going to throw them up there so you can see. Um, but a couple of things to work on a double stroke roll. First, the, the very first thing we talked about, and we talked about this with with snare drum before, but to play a good double stroke roll, we have to keep all of our fingers on the stick. Buzz roll, we get we take our fingers off. And we remember that, but for a double stroke roll, all fingers stay on the stick. Okay, we don't take them off, all right? So we don't want to take things off, otherwise we're going to pinch the notes. We want to work on first being able to play 16th notes, right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, cleanly, slowly, all right? Can we do... There's no bouncing going on there. That's all single stroke rolls, right? Single strokes, right? There's no bounces. If we can't do that, there's no way we're going to be able to play a roll cleanly. All right. So once we get that happening, we can speed that up. Again, I'm still doing single stroke. This isn't bounces yet. And what we're looking for is it sounds exactly like. We don't have any three bounces in one hand and one bounce in the other hand. It's all even, two bounces in a hand. Then we want to slowly speed that up. There's tons of different exercises we can do to work on speeding that up. Um, um, we have, I think, a... Those are not bounces, right? Those are all single strokes. All right, but again, we're working on super clarity, all right? So then we can take that and we can speed that up even more so it becomes a roll. sure again your 16th notes and the roll sound the same so I can play the say I'll do two beats of 16th notes and then two beats of a roll and again they should be very 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 similar almost the same it should sound all right I wonder how loud this is in the camera it's loud to me so um all right now, to me, so those are great. It's all getting your four stroke traps to figure out, getting your diddles to happen, very, very important. The number one exercise to work on is to get their brains engaged. It's very difficult with young high school drummers to get them in the moment, right? It's very easy for them to be thinking about 
what they're doing for class later, what they're going out tonight to do, what they're, you know, what their girlfriend's doing, what their boyfriend's doing, whatever it is, their minds are elsewhere. So I like to have exercises whose only job is to get them into here and now. One of my favorite ones, and we don't do it as often as I'd like here, at least this year, last year we didn't, um, is a countdown. It's really, really, really simple. And so all it is, it starts out eight notes with the right hand. So it's kind of eights, but we're going to accent the first one. So the first one's going to be a downstroke, and then we're going to have um, seven uh, taps after it. So eight notes total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we do the left hand. Now we're going to do seven notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. We do six, five, four, three, two, one. So we'll do the whole exercise. And then if you can mark time to it, you know, every other bar, you're going to be off because you have sevens and fives and threes, okay? Um, so it's a great exercise to get people engaged. You don't necessarily have something that's that difficult, but something to make them think about what they're doing is really, really important. That's one of the most important things to get the drummers to be engaged. If they're thinking, if they're really dialed into what's going on, then they're going to play so much, so much better. Good. Um, all right. Um, there is more general snare drum stuff that I want to talk about as we go, uh, but I want to, I'll, I'll probably do those once we do the other instruments. Read this chapter. It's huge. It's an enormous chapter, but it's filled with some great, great stuff. He's really updated it. Most of the stuff in this chapter is good, reliable stuff. Um, so it's really, really important. Uh, to, to have a kind of good solid foundation with this and if you have the book with the DVD I would recommend you watch the DVD on marching percussion they of course it's dated it's very very old now but they follow the University of Arizona drumline from from the beginning of the show through the performance so you can see the process of learning all the steps along the way all the learning the notes putting the rehearsing the notes uh, putting it all together and then performing it. And it's a really cool, cool DVD. Um, which brings me to one last point for today. Um, the idea of hiring a drumline specialist for your band. Um, I would recommend it if you have the funds. If you can afford to have a person come in and work with your drumline, I would do it. Reason being is a lot of the things that we do are very different from what your horns do. Okay? It's so much easier to play second trumpet in a marching band and to fit in the ensemble and to, to think the same way that the second clarinet player and the second flute and the second trombone. They all think very similarly. They're all playing similar notes. It's a very, very common thing. This is a whole other beast. This is a whole other thing. And if you're not giving them some dedicated time outside of rehearsals to practice, they're going to not be able to keep up with your band and if you don't have somebody to work with them all right you we all know if you have kids taking charge you know just a regular high school kid in the drum line being the leader that breeds a lot of drama and problems and so if you can afford it I would get a specialist they're really really helpful um, it'd be great if you could pay them now it's really common and this is a, is a nice kind of hybrid um, Sally graduates, all right, she's going off to college, but she's graduated, she can come back and she can work your drum line, all right? That's a great way to give somebody experience. Now she's getting some experience teaching, um, but it might be free, or if it, at the very least, it's cheap. Um, and it's a great way to kind of keep those kids still in got involved with your program, all right? But it's really important to have a, a dedicated person doing the drum line. Now, you, I, you may not be able to pay them all year. You may be only able to pay them for part of the season, 
Um, but whatever you can afford, it's really helpful to have that. Um, so, uh, good. So we will do um, the next video, which I'm going to do tomorrow, which will be Tuesday, with some full ensemble concepts, um, and then we should be good. So the three questions for snare drum, three questions are, what head should you get to the top of your drum? What's the top batter head? What should you get? What two brands should you buy for your snare drum? And what are the rudiments? What are rudiments? What drum should you buy? And what type of head should you get for the top head of your snare drum? Great. Thank you very much.